Uh, I'm gonna talk about our paper, Breaking Web Applications on Top of Encrypted Data. Um, this is joint work uh, with my awesome co-authors, none of whom could make it here today, unfortunately. Uh, Richard McPherson, Mohammed Navid, uh, Tom Rustampart, and Vitaly Shmodikov. Uh, so in this paper, we uh, study systems built on property revealing encryption. Uh, we kind of identify a general class of systems that uh, all have the same property that they use PRE to kind of enable functionality on the server side. And we uh, take as a case study for these, this class of systems uh, a paper called Mylar, which was published in NSDI 2014 uh, by Popa et al. And uh, to kind of think about their security in general, we, we created some concrete threat models for these systems. And against Mylar, we found uh, some serious attacks in all of our threat models. Uh, in the worst case, we were able to recover almost 70% of the encrypted keywords uh, in, in the documents in the Mylar system. And the takeaway of this work is that um, there's a lot of kind of whole system challenges that are still left to, to solve before we can really put our trust in these kinds of these kinds of systems that are built on property revealing encryption. So web applications are amazing and everybody uses them. They're really ubiquitous, um, but they basically have two parts. There's a client front end that runs on a, a browser or on a mobile phone, and uh, there's a back end that runs on a, a server that the client communicates with. The, uh, the data that's generated on the client side is uh, stored uh, only on the server. Uh, this model works just fine until there's a breach and user privacy is compromised. Uh, because there's still lots of breaches, uh, we're starting to understand how to secure systems, but they're still kind of happening with alarming frequency. So uh, we want to be able to understand how to secure systems and secure user privacy even in the event uh, of a breach. Uh, so one seemingly obvious solution that a lot of people have come up with is to uh, encrypt the data using a key that's stored only on the client side. Uh, the, the data is encrypted before it's, it's put on the server, and uh, this, this kind of prevents user privacy loss in the event of a breach, um, but it, it doesn't really enable functionality of the application. Like, almost by definition, all of the useful information is removed after encryption. So uh, in the last, like, 15 years or so, the, the cryptography community has kind of looked at this problem and come up with a kind of compromise solution of these encryption systems, these encryption schemes, rather, that kind of preserve just enough functionality by leaking a little bit of information um, to protect confidentiality, but at the same time uh, enable these applications to kind of run in the same way. Um, these, in this paper, we coined the term property revealing encryption. Um, some people also call it property preserving encryption, um, but I, for obvious reasons, like this one better. Um, this enables, uh, like I said, it enables functionality like search and applications. There are a lot of systems now that use these kinds of uh, property revealing encryption schemes. Um, both in academia and in industry, there's like an enormous amount of interest in, in property revealing encryption. And we realized that there's a commonality between all these systems that use PRE, uh, so we decided to coin uh, yet another term for these, these class of systems. We call them BOPETs for building on property revealing encryption. Um, and the, the kinds of property revealing encryption that these systems use are order preserving encryption, which preserves sort order, which we saw uh, a little bit ago um, in Giorgio's talk. Um, searchable encryption, which um, the, um, David just talked about. Oh, my, my monitors. Yeah, searchable encryption, um, which we just saw in the last talk, which preserves the ability to do like keyword search over encrypted data. And deterministic encryption, which is a kind of special case of searchable encryption, which allows you to preserve the equality relationship between plain texts. Um, just to just to make this a little bit more concrete, if you if you look at like this last row, like minus cryptdb, this last row of the um, of the table has received like these three companies have received like a little over two hundred million dollars in VC funding in like the last four years. Um, so this is like, you know, this is real money that people are spending on BOPETs. Um, so we kind of, you know, it's kind of important to understand their security. And to do this, uh, we can take the example of a hypothetical cloud application called Cloud Drive. Um, and for the functionality of searchable encryption, the orange user would have a private document on the server that it encrypts with a key that it stores locally. 
uh, it would be able to use this key to issue keyword queries and check whether its documents uh, contain a certain keyword. Now, in this application, the orange user might also want to collaborate on a shared document with the blue user. Uh, to do this, because these documents have different kind of access control properties, um, we want to encrypt that document with, that shared document with a different key than we encrypt the, the private document of the orange user with. This, um, this preserves kind of the functionality of search rule encryption that we need, but the problem with using these separate keys is that the orange user's burden in terms of uh, generating a search queries is, is the, the overhead in terms of generating search query is basically linear the number of documents it has access to, um, which in the worst case you can imagine this is onerous for, for the orange client, especially if it's a low power device or something. So in uh, 2013, Popa and Zeldovich kind of uh, invented a, a pretty, pretty clever th scheme that gets around this by allowing the blue user who creates the, the shared document to essentially add the orange user to the, the document and the orange user, rather than getting the key for the document, it gives a, a kind of conversion token to the server. And this token essentially gives the server the ability to convert its queries under its own key to queries uh, under the key of the, uh, of the blue document. So again, when the orange user issues a search query, the, the server is able to use this token without any interaction from the user. and um, generate a search query that allows it to check whether the blue document contains keywords as well. So this is, this is a really, really clever PRE scheme and it's, it's a really cool construction, um, but it's not the whole story, right? We know that systems are very, very complicated and they contain a lot of complex and rich interactions between the data and the functionality and the users that might introduce additional leakages. Um, so the basic question we want to ask ourselves here about BOPETS is how do we build a system that uses this property revealing encryption and, and keeps user data confidential? So to answer this question, the first, the first step is really to develop concrete threat models. And we do, in this paper, we develop three basic threat models for BOPETS. The weakest threat model is a snapshot passive threat model where the adversary breaks into the server and essentially steals a one-time copy of the, uh, of the data and the metadata. Uh, the next stronger threat model is a persistent passive threat where the adversary breaks in and essentially um, it monitors the communication and access patterns over a period of time uh, between the clients and their data. And the strongest threat model is the active threat model. And this is kind of in all of the above the, the adversary can do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, um, and this is, this is a very strong threat model. To see how current BOPETs uh, withstand th these different kinds of threats, we took as a case study a paper called Mylar from NSDI 2014. Um, it has a long, it was by Pope et al, a long list of authors with long names who I won't, I won't all, I won't all say. Um, but basically the idea is they took an existing JavaScript web application framework called Meteor um, and they added, um, they added kind of like annotations that allow non-security expert developers to annotate fields that, that they consider sensitive in their application and then the Mylar client and server handle like transparently um, kind of getting, doing encryption and decryption and ensuring that the users can get the right keys for their, for their documents. And to do this, it, it uses a little bit of metadata about the, the access control relationships between clients and documents. Um, and this is, this is abstractly can be represented as a kind of like graph um, that they call the principal graph in the paper. So the security goal of Mylar is essentially to protect the confidentiality of the user's data um, even against an attacker that has full access to servers. So the threat model in which they want to achieve the security goal is essentially an active threat model. Um, in their paper, they describe some things that the attacker can do with this threat model. Um, again, the server can fully be controlled by the adversary. The adversary can send arbitrary responses to any request by a client. And in fact, the, the adversary can collude with some, some users as well. In this paper, we investigated uh, some applications that both were released with Mylar and we ourselves ported to Mylar, uh, ported to work on top of Mylar according to the guidelines in their paper. 
And in this paper, we found that several attacks were able to violate this security goal. And we demonstrate ways in which essentially Mylar does not meet its security goal. In the, the threat model stated by the Mylar paper, we were we give an attack that's able to recover uh, all of the, the keyword queries and simulated experiments. And through access pattern leakage is uh, able to recover about 70% of the keywords in the encrypted documents. In the weaker threat models we study, um, the, we note that the uh, persistent passive threat model, an adversary is able to recover the medical conditions of patients. Um, and I, for time reasons, I can't go into this, but um, you can see the, the paper for more details on this attack. And in the snapshot passive threat model, the weakest threat model, we note that the metadata um, about this access control relationships uh, itself um, can leak confidential information. So let's, let's start with this, this attack first. This is in the snapshot passive threat model um, where the client, uh, where the adversary rather, gets only the metadata about the access control relationships between the, uh, the different clients and the documents. Um, but this metadata has security properties uh, itself and this, unless the, the system designer is very careful, it can leak the data that was intended to be protected by encryption. So we, uh, we study in more detail the risks of this metadata, and we note that it's, it's not really covered by the encryption, but it's, it, it is really necessary for the system to work. It, it, it is what enables clients to get the correct keys that they need to be able to share and access their data. But the metadata depends on the data, so it, we have to be careful about leaking sensitive information through the metadata itself. And for an example of how this can happen, um, we can look just at the Mylar paper itself. Um, this is a diagram that the hypothetical scenario is you have these two employees talking about a party that they don't want their boss to know about. Um, this, the, the, the text of the conversation itself is encrypted by Mylar, but the, the metadata, including the name of the, the, the principal corresponding to this chat room is not encrypted. Um, so what we see is that a snapshot passive adversary can see that the name of this principal is party. So in fact, the, the boss will know about the party. And because the, because the adversary has this kind of um, access control graph and the user's names are decrypted as well, or in clear text as well, the adversary will know who's going to the party. So this is, this is just one attack so we kind of want to step back and uh, think about uh, metadata and BOPETs more generally. Um, metadata is really necessary for these systems to work. And uh, it's not just Mylar that punts on, on metadata. I think uh, all BOPETs uh, it kind of it, it assume that it's implicitly outside of the, th the threat model. Um, but, but what we really want to motivate in this work is that, that it, it, that's a very dangerous assumption and there really are confidentiality properties of this metadata that we need to think about. Um, but it's tricky because this metadata is like kind of the glue that holds this application together. So you have this glue, but it also needs to be encrypted itself. Um, and it, it just seems like, like a very hard problem to solve. So uh, the next uh, threat model and attack I'll talk about is the active threat model. And this is where the adversary can do whatever it wants. And in fact, it can collude with some users as well. Um, our attack uh, allows us to recover the plain text of documents. Um, it, it can work in one of two ways. The first way is basically the adversary creating a harmless, innocuous, or even empty document on the server and sharing it with the orange user. The orange user's client automatically sends this key conversion token to the server. Once the server has this key conversion token, when the orange user makes a query, it can combine it with the, the, uh, the key of this document that it knows and get something that is morally equivalent to an unkeyed hash of, of this keyword. And using an offline dictionary that never actually enters the Mylar system, it can, it can perform a dictionary attack to recover the, the, the keyword query. And through the access pattern leakage, which I'll explain uh, further in a second, it can also recover the, the keywords in the documents. The second way this attack can occur is even if you could design a, a perfect 
it's trust system and have genius users that never make any security mistakes, if a trust relationship exists between the blue user and the orange user, um, so the, the blue user shares, is trusted and shares a document with the orange user, and then the orange user's client generates this conversion value. Uh, if the blue user is hacked through no fault of its own after this trust relationship is established, uh, any further searches by the orange user will be able to be brute forced in the same way uh, using this unkeyed hash. Um, this is notable because it compromises not only the documents of the blue user, it also compromises the private documents of any user that ever trusted the blue user with any document. Even if this, like, even if this, this document is like it, is, is private, like a blue user never even knew it existed. Um, but, because of, but because of the functionality of this key sharing, the adversary is able to um, recover the keywords of that document as well. And I've, I've said this a couple times and it's probably good to explain to, to everybody who's not familiar with these attacks how access patterns can reveal uh, keywords in the documents. Um, basically, the functionality of search allows you to tell whether a, a keyword appears in a document. So when the orange user issues a search query, if the adversary knows the underlying keyword of that search query, it can tell using the functionality of the scheme whether this keyword appears in, in a document. And if it searches, uh, if the orange user searches this word work that appears in both documents, both the orange user's private document and the shared document, then because of the functionality of the scheme, the adversary will be able to tell whether it exists, like, will be able to tell that it appears in both documents. And then it could continue to search and re keep revealing more plain text. So to assess kind of how damaging this attack would be in typical settings, uh, we decided to run some experiments. Um, we used the Ubuntu uh, IRC chat logs that were mentioned in the last talk um, we, as kind of a stand-in for the private data uh, in, the, in their KChat application. And we uh, sampled user queries according to the distribution of the keywords in the documents, um, this, this following prior work on the subject. And we used a, the largest dictionary of English words we could find, which was a little over 350,000 words. Um, and the, computing this, this thing that's morally equivalent to a hash, um, but it's important to note that it actually is not a hash, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, computing it only takes about 15 minutes of wall clock time, and then that, that attack dictionary applies to every search made by any user in the system. So this is the result of our experiments, and I think this, this got truncated, but this is essentially the, the number of simulated queries that we make uh, over, we take the average over 20 trials. Um, so we start at 100 queries, and as we uh, move up to about 2,000 queries, we see that the, the recovery rate in terms of the number of, the number of keywords recovered uh, as a percentage of the overall number of keywords in all the documents, we see that it goes from a little under 30% um, all the way up to about 70% uh, with, with only 2,000 simulated queries. And we were also able, our, our attack dictionary contained every query that was sampled as well, so we were able to recover 100% of the keyword queries. This is, this is a really powerful attack, um, and I think it's worth, it's worth dwelling on because it's, it's got a couple of interesting properties. Um, be, because the query recovery part of this attack only relies on the key sharing functionality. It recovers search keywords that never appear in any document on the server. And this is, I, th I think, differs from all prior work on these query recovery attacks. I think they all um, require some kind of access pattern leakage. Um, so even if the, the, all of Mylar were somehow run in some kind of oblivious storage or private information retrieval, um, just the functionality of the search game would allow us to recover keyword queries. Um, one other interesting property of this attack and what it demonstrates is that the security guarantee of this Mylar uh, multi-key searchable encryption scheme is very brittle in the sense that it, one user making one mistake can compromise essentially everybody's uh, private, private information. And um, this is interesting uh, if in general, but uh, one other interesting property is that it kind of allows the adversary to jump up the, the trust graph and uh, compromise low trust users by compromising high trust users. 
Um, so by that I mean if you take a setting where you have like a medical setting where you have maybe just a few doctors treating a lot of patients, it means that you can compromise the doctors by compromising the least secure of the patients, um, which is, it, it, this is a really interesting and in some sense bad property for the scheme to have because it, it means that there's some kind of trust problem going on here. So the bigger picture on these active attacks is that this, this brute forcing the hash thing is specific to Mylar, um, but we conjecture that active attacks exist on other BOPETs. Um, active attacks are really, really hard. Uh, in general, they're really hard, and in BOPETs they're even harder because almost by design you're trusting the server to do some kind of um, cryptographic processing on your data, but an active adversary is able to kind of abuse this, this encryption functionality in whatever way it wants. So it, it, it's, it's very hard to kind of guarantee any security in the active, in the active model for BOPETs. Um, this, this seems like, it, it's, it, to, to solve this, this problem, it seems that very heavyweight techniques are necessary to kind of verify security critical operations that the, that the, the, the adversary or the server uh, performs. So in conclusion, uh, the security of BOPETs uh, is still pretty poorly understood. Um, fundamental design properties of these systems like access control metadata can leak um, information that's designed to be encrypted by the, uh, the encryption scheme, or designed to be protected by the encryption scheme, rather. And uh, access patterns uh, do as well. Um, and for this, you can refer to the paper. I didn't discuss it in this talk. And uh, the active adversaries are, are very powerful, and especially in BOPETs, it seems like a very difficult and still unsolved challenge to kind of both define and uh, recover some kind of security against active adversaries. And uh, we found that integrating property revealing encryption into systems is still really tricky and not well understood. So, thank you. Okay, questions? Um, thanks, this is great work. Um, about 20 years ago, we did something on active attacks on inference control in medical databases uh, because the Iceland was a database that would encrypt everybody's names, mm -hmm. um, but where the um, pseudonyms were generated by a third party and where potentially bad people had access to the encrypted database of all records. Mm -hmm. And a trivial attack on that we found uh, was simply to file a prescription for the target person in the system, which would immediately tell you what the um, pseudonym for that particular person mm -hmm. was. So I've always been deeply suspicious of in, uh, computing with encrypted data, and it's great that you have pulled it apart in this way. If one's trying to create um, uh, a system that does withstand active adversaries, perhaps a model is to look at the inference control literature uh, and see what sort of attacks are possible there and try and figure out whether it's even conceptually possible to, to build a system that can give useful protection against them, regardless of how good the cryptographic mechanisms are. So there's, there's stuff in this old literature to mine, I'm saying. Okay, I, I didn't know that, that literature existed, but thank you for, thank you for the pointer. Um, it's, it's interesting, like, I, I agree with the point about active attacks, and actually I just wrote uh, another paper about order-preserving encryption, but like, there's this example in that paper that like, another example of a, a trivial active attack on these systems where like it seems like the way that people want to use them is is in some cases going to lead to active attacks almost inherently um, especially in like like open systems like your example was like like prescriptions but like if you have a medical if you have like a medical uh, like, an, like an medical office application, and all you have to do to do an active attack is essentially go make an appointment with a doctor. It seems like this is gonna be a very hard problem to solve. So, thank you. Yeah. Paul in our shot. Um, great work, and also um, I wanna commend you on the talk, a very clear talk, and, and it's a great to see talks. Thank you, so nice. thank you. Um, so this wasn't just um, like a system that was you know, built by some people in practice and you happen to have broken it. You know, I mean. If I understand, these systems were, were you know, formally proven in some papers. Could you say a bit more about what went wrong in um, you know, the, the people who um, had worked on this, these systems before, 
what mistakes were made or what did they not foresee so that we, we can learn from this? Um, well, I think uh, the, 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 oh, this, this question is a minefield. Um, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> like, trying to like, um, these, yeah, it's, it's interesting to kind of uh, take, try to take lessons away from uh, the Mylar paper. And these people definitely, I mean, this is a group that's, these are real systems builders, you know? These are, these are people who can like, you know, sit down and build a system, no joke. Um, but I, I think what went wrong is kind of, is uh, in a sense underestimating the difficulty of some of these, of some of these problems and um, kind of believing that s solutions would work like, to, especially to stop active attacks, but believing that these so solutions would work that were good in theory, but maybe didn't hold up um, to the way that the system would really be deployed. Were the, um, were the models just wrong, or were there errors in the, in the uh, techniques? So, the, so the, the, the security definitions themselves, um, I might actually have slides. Um, yeah, so like the security definitions themselves are, are really wonky. Um, in the paper, we go into some detail about the kind of the shortcomings of these security definitions. Um, I like just because I don't think this is an audience that in general cares that much about security definitions. I didn't like put it in my talk, um, but like what they what they do yeah, yeah. what they do is um, they they use two separate definitions and this. This is, uh, like, in searchable encryption especially, this is a really, really dangerous thing to do. And, like, uh, Kurt Mola et al., like, at this conference, I think, like, 10 years ago, had this, this really nice paper that had this counterexample in an appendix where they showed that, like, basically, like, using, like, the, I think this was Chang and Mitzenmacher's paper that had, like, these two different definitions for data privacy and query privacy. And what they did was they constructed a counterexample that shows that, like, you can have a scheme that's secure in both of these models individually, but that doesn't compose into a secure searchable encryption scheme. And so this, this definitional problem is, is really tough, and I, I don't know, actually, if there's a, a good way to define security in this setting, because it seems like the, the functionality that they're trying to get is gonna enable very serious active attacks against like the, the, the standard simulation-based adversary that you would give. Um, so. Black is the session chair for the next session, but I also thought, so, so the speakers of the next session please, uh, come, come to me afterwards. And I also, I also have a question, so it's not just uh, that. Um, so really, really nice work, uh, wonderful. And it all, I also have the feeling that you thought about kind of how to do it right, um, so in terms of definitions. And so do you have anything to say in terms of like, um, what, what, is, what can you do better? What can we learn from it? Um, I guess just, Doing everything in plain text is not a solution. So yeah, well, definitionally, I think the first step is to is to develop a holistic definition that covers all the functionality in one, uh, preferably simulation-based um, paradigm. Because that, I mean, for a couple of reasons, that's like what other searchable encryption papers do, and it seems it seems natural in this setting. Um, but it, it seems, especially the key sharing functionality that they're trying to achieve with the searchable encryption scheme, it seems like it. it it might actually just be impossible. Like there might just be an impossibility result that says in the active threat model you, that this brute forcing attack always exists unless you use, you do some kind of query randomization or you have some kind of oblivious, you know, some kind of a weird oblivious thing going on. Um, I, I've thought about it, but it seems like a hard problem and uh, I'm gonna continue to think more about it, so. All right. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.